Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I'm Evan Irwin and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hi. Ruben Bressler. Greetings, how you doing? Everything is lovely. We are here to talk about things being destroyed, destruction. Right. Well, that, that could be argued. We we it kind of vague. We gotta right. leave it a little kind of vague. Yeah. So for our for our definition of board wipes, we had a little bit of a discussion of what is a board wipe, and this is sort of like the what is a grizzly bear, what is a colossal dreadmaw kind of alignment chart. Hmm. We decided. So I guess we'll see how we all decided. But for me, it was a, um, it needed to affect creatures at the very least. It needed to affect all creatures. Because when mm -hmm. I think board wipe, I don't think uh, purify. I don't think destroy right. all artifacts and enchantments. That's not a board wipe to me. Right. A board wipe is all creatures. And so I needed the word all, and I needed the word creatures, or I just needed like all permanents. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so that's how I, how I uh, defined it. I have a little bit of everything. I have some mass edicts. I have some bouncing. I've got some exile in. I've got some destroying. I've got some damage in. Um, yeah. For me, it was really important to cover all five colors. And I had to dig a little bit deeper for the green side, but um, I think I found a really great card that I've uh, had the pleasure of playing with oh, a couple wow. times. And so I really wanted just a nice range. Of, I wanted to show the versatility of ways that you could kill something. And I think I, and also I have a couple that are just cards I love, love, love to cast. You know, I'm probably, I'm probably the more of a black mage than you two. So I love, I'm all for killing things. I love the sound of a nice clean battlefield. So this is right. very much up my alley. So we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most luxuriant and letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top 10 demons. Ruben? Right. And there were a couple of options here. I thought that uh, y'all did a good job this week with, with your thoughts. But this week's winner, I decided, would be Nicholas Bassett, who writes, The one demon I'm surprised no one mentioned has appeared on five cards. He's the only demon to appear on cards that has ascended to being a planeswalker. He first appeared in Zendikar, and his ride through the multiverse has been rough to this day. Ob Nixilis. Human to planeswalker to demon to demon to planeswalker and all around dick to birds. The dick to birds. Yeah, the, problem with Nixilis, the problem with Omnixilis is, I, I mean, I hate to say it, I just don't think he's a very interesting character. Like, they just really haven't given him a lot of depth. I know there was the weird thing of Ravnica of like him killing birds for fun, but it was right. like, you, you know, know I, I'm just. They just think the character needs a little more. I agree. And Obnixilis, really, though, Obnixilis the Fallen. Uh, which which uh, was qualifies for our list is a demon itself mm -hmm. um, is really the first big bad that brought the gate watch together yeah. in the first place and so we do have Obnixilis to thank for for that for our extended universe as it yeah. were yeah yeah I mean at least clearly on his um, on his flavor text about you know he lost his spark and then he plots revenge on the plane while who's corrupting mana fractured his soul and. You know, just, like, being angry and, like, being, like, dark and brooding is just, you gotta do something else. Mm -hmm. right. It's very one note when it comes to Ob, but but in terms of demons that we should know and that maybe wizards could do something with that would be interesting, well, it's... Really I did crazy. lose to one of the Ob Nixilises. Uh Tappy Topa was playing a Lord Windgrace deck, and she decided to scape shift with that one that drains you, and she was like, whoop, 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 and I was like, I'm not even mad. This is a That's really great. sweet way to die. Yeah. I mean, I would. Uh, I, I I thought it was interesting for those D and D fans out there that Magic the Gathering treats demons and devils backwards than how Dungeons and Dragons does. In D and D, demons are the chaotic ones, the ones that don't really have all their faculties, whereas the devils are the ones that sign contracts and have schemes and are the the have political machinations. Hmm. And it's sort of backwards in Magic. The devils are, you know, the one one tokens that deal damage when they die, whereas it seems that the demons are the ones with, you know, Liliana's contracts, for example. Hmm. I'd almost say that wizards would like revel in it just because particularly when they, they put D and D and magic together, you know what I mean? Like they yeah. really didn't want to work together. Magic was never come to D and D like they used to be hardcore, like militant. Yeah. This is never happening. And, and now we have bag of holding. 
Yay! We did it, and everybody! We're going to be playing D&D on Ravnica soon. I mean, it's, the worlds are colliding. God, I've waited years and years for stuff like this. But Obnixilus, the hate twisted, you know, showed up recently in War of the Spark, and yep. Obnixilus the cruelty, and he's being addicted to birds, and that's weird. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, like, seriously, that's like their story note, right? Yeah. He's like the jester right. now? Like, you know, he's the, com- he's the comic relief? <clears throat> right. Okay. Like, I, I get that it's tough to give everybody a unique thing to do. But, you know, Endgame pulled it off. It's true. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much for participating in the show. And yeah. thanks to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring that giveaway. Uh, please try to contact Aaron if you're not already in her block list. You might be soon. You never know. Um, hope it's something eternal. to aspire to. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's a notch, you know. I blocked Brad Nelson and look what ended up, Look what happened to him. There you go. Perfect. Right. He's got second place. Even <laughs> though you wouldn't know it if you actually went to MagicIron.com because they don't talk about who wins oh oh, oh all right talk about that tomorrow i'm sure that's right that said we're going to go ahead and get started with our top 10 board wipes uh i i do gotta admit i i lean pretty hard into the one color on this one obviously you know what that is but ruben can you and kick us off Aaron, Aaron on purpose went for a much wider swath i mean it's pride month if you can't have a rainbow in your board wipes where can you have a rainbow you know? and i i didn't i didn't stick to the one color but i i'm i'm certainly somewhere in between i've got a little bit of uh, a better uh width and height than <laughs> You know, it's not, it's not hot. Would you describe it as girth? Good, (laughs) sir. No, I would not describe it as girth. Sounds girthy. Not going to lie. The board wipes are already all, they already affect everything. (laughs) The the board wipes hang low, you see. (laughs) And sometimes they swing to and fro. Not doing it. (laughs) it. Ruben's been so wholesome today. It's a little disappointing. All right. Ruben, watch number 10. Some of us have to keep it together for the kids, Aaron. All right. For the children. Some of us, yeah. For those of you that don't know, Magic Mike's is for the children. <laughs> wow, that was uh, awesome. With that said, uh, no, I can't kick it off because I'm the only one with hires this week, and one of them is my number ten. Excellent, Aaron. Yes. I know. Again, this is one of the first weeks in a long, long time where I have no hires or sames. That's, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's the first time ever, but it's, it's close. That's it. Aaron, what's your number 10? My number 10 is a really interesting, exciting version of a board wipe uh, that was given to us in Theros. Uh, One of the nice things about Theros for me was seeing all of these Greek myths and stories that I read growing up be incorporated into a magic card and the recognition there of, oh, you know, that's supposed to be Narcissus. That's supposed to be um you know prometheus and all of those things and so um and and you know some people not getting it and you remembering what they mean and 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 seeing the way that it worked and if it worked the way that you thought it would um and no card really sparked my nostalgia like my number 10 uh which is curse of the swine um so curse of the swine is x and two blue it's a sorcery exile x target creatures uh for each creature exiled this way its controller puts a two two green boar creature token onto the battlefield you get piggies um, and so this is a rare blue board wipe of sorts. You can exile anything you want, which was really important because we had gods in Theros, which were indestructible. Um, and so being able to exile indestructible things and deal with them, you can deal with as many as you want to. And they get a pig, which is fine. You're happy with that. The tokens were adorable. Um, this is a moment from Greek mythology with Circe, uh, yep. where Circe turned people into pigs. You know, she was sort of the evil sorceress. And so um, I really enjoyed this moment in Greek mythology. I like the way they made it a card. And it's just great giving people little piggies. Just piggies. I just, I just love when you're just like, wow, that feels really strangely blue to yeah. like exile things, but you're still giving them creatures. But yep. blue is exiling creatures, which is always awesome. Even if it's just like a, just a, you know, it just, just looks weird. You're like, this is odd. Yeah. Freaks this me out. little piggy, piggy went to the exile zone. This little piggy went to the graveyard. This little piggy. I just love it. Yep. It is terrific. Well, for my number 10, uh, got a kick at old school. As Ooh. it were, um, this thing, I, I thought that this is one of those cards where I'm like, oh man, I bet this card is worth a whole bunch of money because a lot of people play it in casual formats, right? Right? It's like worth a buck. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but they recently gave it some new artwork, which is sweet. Ooh. Uh, and it's one of those cards from back in the day. And this was, uh, this was a very exciting card when it first debuted, like super duper exciting. Um, in a world that had started to see new cards coming from the world of invasion. Invasion was one of like the big moments of magic, like, coming back, you know, when they was had their big low points. And so when you first saw Route 
and you were like, wow, I can just pay more mana and instant speed, kabam, Wrath of God, that's crazy. Yeah. So two white, three generic mana for a rare sorcery from Invasion. You may play Route anytime you could play an instant if you pay two generic more to play it and destroy all creatures. They can't be regenerated. So this is one of those things where they got, they put it back in Commander 2017, which was awesome, uh, which has an amazing Elish Norn quote on it, which is great. Um, so, you know, connects it to a, a more sort of modern audience, which is awesome. But it's also one of those things that because it has that line of they can't be regenerated, I don't think we're going to see this one standard anytime soon. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is, this is noteworthy for a couple of reasons. You mentioned the can't be regenerated in speed. Um, I'm a big fan of the Commander 2017 art with Elish Norn, where she says, end this, what I seek is greater. Um, just so good. Unconditioned kills everything. Um, it doesn't have... Some board wipes have weird clauses of certain toughness, certain power, certain mm -hmm. converted mana costs, you know, certain colors. This is just everything. Like, this is great. Yeah, this just takes them out. Absolutely. Yeah, Route is, uh, was very common in Standard. Just a great card. Mm -hmm. It's all infinite play at the time, and uh, was terrific. All right, so let's move on here to number nine. Ruben, do you have a number nine? I do. I have a number nine, and it's a card that I've cast a lot of. Um, I think that it might be the board wipe that was like the card I cast the first as like my competitive uh, life began in Magic. When I learned Magic um, was about three weeks after Exodus came out. Exodus. But I didn't get com I didn't get competitive for a little while after that, uh, maybe another six to nine months after that. Um, but when I first started getting competitive, um, the decks that I liked involved were, were what we called at the time the mono brown decks that used a lot of the artifact mana that was available to you in Urza's block. Things like Voltaic Key, Grim Monolith, Thran Dynamo. And those went really well with uh, my number nine, which is Wildfire. Mm. Wildfire is four colorless red red, originally from Urza's Saga, but with a long pedigree. Uh, are then printed in Portal 2nd Age, 7th uh, Edition, ninth Edition, and most recently in Modern Masters 2015. It costs four colorless red-red and is a sorcery. Each player sacrifices four lands, and Wildfire deals four damage to each creature. That's brutal. Uh, was just a spectacular card in a number of different decks, in including, of course, winning the Pro Tour in the hands of Casey McCarroll in 1999. Uh, in that Ponza deck, um, was also popular in Masticore style decks. Um, Kai Bude won Worlds that year as well with the mono brown style. Uh, really good alongside Covetous Dragon, because Covetous Dragon had five toughness and required you to have a bunch of artifacts. Uh, and then later was really popular alongside Magnivore um, in those sorcery style Ponza decks that just stone rained and pillaged you into, uh, into submission. Just a really cool card uh, and, and just one of my favorites of all time. I love the flavor text. The fire is always at the top of the food chain and it has a big appetite. Like, yeah. oof, Ron Spencer. I mean, Stone Rain is a card that we haven't had in standard in uh, like 13 years or something crazy. Yeah. Um, and people just don't know what it feels like to eye of nowhere your opponent's <laughs> land. Yep. And then stone rain it <clears throat> and, and then stone rain it again. And they play the second one. And then you have the demolish at that point. And then you play the magnivore and just bruh. And if they keep on, you'll just wildfire and your magnivore is gigantic and they die to it. And it's crazy. Mm. Um, this, th yeah, this was a hell of a card uh, back when it first debuted in Urza, uh, Urza Saga, right? Yep. Urza Saga. Yep. Urza Saga. It was huge and standard. Gigantic deck. And when they reprinted it again in seventh edition, I don't think it made a lot of waves, but when it came back in ninth, ugh, I mean, it was huge. They, yeah. had, they had annex for God's sake, four uh, mana <laughs> enchantment, gain control, target land. Oh, yeah. It was so when you destroy and ramp with the same <clears throat> card, the blue Mon Vuli acid moss. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That was not, not what we describe as fun. Uh, Aaron, what's number nine? My number nine is a rare green board wipe. So green's way of dealing with things uh, has been established as to fight them. You know, you have prey upon, um, you know, black just outright kills you. Red's way of dealing with you is just to do damage to you. White typically is the exile color. Blue exiles sometimes, or they might, you know, transmogrify something of like turn a creature into an ape or to a lizard, or they might freeze you or they might bounce you. And so each color has its way of dealing with things and green's way of doing with it is to fight. 
to have creatures fight each other. Um, and we've seen uh, some smaller scale versions of that, which are fine, um, but this is really being done on a massive scale. Uh, my number nine is Azuri's Predation. Um, so Azuri's Predation is from Commander 2015. It's a sorcery, five colorless and three green, which is not hard for green to do. Um, for each creature your opponents control, put a four, four green beast creature token out of the battlefield. Each of those beasts fights a different one of those creatures. Wow. Um, so it's very unconventional in terms of like, it's not a mass bounce. It's not a wipe as we know it, but if you're playing things that are at four or less, they're dying. And it's such a cool way of like just everything kind of just spawning a beast and then they go at it. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. This is the type of spell that just goes completely nuts in like a four or five player game. And uh -huh. it's like, all right, what's everybody got? Count creatures, make tokens. Uh -huh. da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting one. The, the <clears throat> green, uh, do you have any other green cards on your list? Spoiler alert, Aaron? I do not, no. Okay. The other one that came close to my mass board wipes that was green was the Great Aurora. Oh, um, yeah. Um, which does, in fact, wipe the board and shuffle it away and then put all the lands into play to replace them. Um, that one came close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's a sweet one. Um, but that said, uh, let's move on here to my number nine. Uh, this is, at this point, it's sort of a classic uh, removal spell. Um, <clears throat> this was one of the cards that when Wizards came back in Magic 2010, when they like hit the reset button on Magic, so you know what? We're classic fantasy. We're going to take it back to alpha. We're going to go back and be what we're good at and like what does it mean and what is a Magic card and all this other stuff and like what are nice, clean, like, you know, good Magic effects that would be exciting on cards. And they literally just gave it back to us. I'm very excited about Planar Cleansing coming back to standard. Yep. Three white, three generic mana, rare sorcery, originally from Magic 2010, that has one sentence, destroy all non-land permanents. Jesus. It's dead. Just kill all of it. Just <laughs> reboot, start over, go back to what you're doing. Planar Cleansing is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a fabulous card. Uh, obviously, one a Pro Tour in the hands of Ivan Flock. Um, with that crazy blue-white control deck that won the final game with Nick's Fleece Rams that we're getting plus one <laughs> on Yes! I do remember that. Oh that shape of Thune. Yeah, with that ridiculous end-game scenario. Um, yeah, Planet Cleansing is a great card to have in Standard. It's even better now that, that uh, Planeswalkers are so much more ubiquitous than they used to be. Uh, and I'm excited to see what it will do to the Standard format. Yeah, it was great because there was that it was tap out control. You know, you just yeah. you get to six, planar cleansing. Maybe they do something else. If you planar cleanse it again, that game was basically done. You had Sphinx's Revelation in there as well. Yeah. Like you could just tap out to do big, powerful things. And you played Elixir of Immortality and you just that was your plan. It was four me to tears control. Well, now yeah. we have Oops All Planeswalker standard, so I'm happy right. to It's <sighs> a good fit, yeah. Get out of here. Go on with you said. I will say that is one thing that this standard is shaping up to have is a lot of answers. We're seeing a lot of graveyard hate, we're seeing a lot of planeswalker answers. Um, which is a blessing because we've certainly covered it on our show of, you know, back when either works Marvel was a thing, we were crying out for a pithing needle, you know, yeah. and so we're, we're approaching a standard now where any deck that could be popular, you're going to have answers for it. And ultimately it's a good thing. Yeah. We were just like, could you, could you make cards like legal because you said they're legal because give us needle Graph figures page is in standard again. Like right. think about that. We're playing dread Horde. Everyone's playing dread Horde decks right now. Um, and so we have, we, we, we were, we would have taken a Tormod's script. Like we weren't picky back then. Like when Delirium was going on and everything else, we weren't asking for that. We would have been happy with a Tormod's script and we couldn't even get that. And so it seems like they listened to the prayers and now we're getting good answers. Yeah. And I think the other part of it is, you know, for the way that I would see it is that they saw or they knew based on the design of the set or whatever, that Command the Dread Horde was going to be one of the best things you could be doing in Standard. And they're like, okay, you get your three months or whatever of fun, and then, bam, here comes Graph Diggers. I'm also right. hoping maybe it's a sign of things to come, of like, there's some broken stuff coming down the pipe. Right. Maybe. Exactly. I'm just a... licking my little chops. I got my, my knife and my like, poo. I'm tying my bib, and I got my knife and my fork, and I'm ready. Very ready. nice. All right, let's move on here to number eight. Ruben, watch number eight. My number eight is uh, a weird one uh, because it is it's a card that when it was printed, I just like like shook my eyes at and was like, this isn't what it says it is. Right. Like what is happening here? Um, because I don't think any of us were really ready for what was coming in Rise of the Eldrazi with with the Eldrazi until they were with us, yeah. you know, colorless, non artifact 
Lovecraftian horrors um, and the crazy world altering effects that they have, things along the lines of All is Dust. So All is Dust is seven colorless or seven generic mana, sorry, for a tribal sorcery Eldrazi. Wow. Each player sacrifices all colored permanents they control. So basically uh, a big giant annihilator trigger um, got around indestructible, uh, got around, you know, it was just everything. It was planner cleansing, but even wider for an additional mana. Um, very popular, of course, in the Eldrazi post kind of decks and the Eldrazi Tron kind of decks. Um, there is a, a, a popular archetype at the time called Eldrazi Green that used it. Um, the green red Eldrazi decks uh, uh, were, were big fans of having access to All is Dust as well. Uh, and these days it is a sometimes a sideboard card in uh, not just those big colorless lands decks like Post and Tron, but also sometimes in the Primeval Titan amulet decks as well. Yeah, we have uh, Eldrazi Tron was a thing. Obviously, there was Eldrazi Winter uh, at the Pro Tour where it was just gross. Um, All is Dust, an exciting card at the time, still an exciting card, almost $10, like recently reprinted in Ultimate Masters, which was sweet. Um, really cool in sort of defining what was important about the Eldrazi. The color versus, versus colorless thing was, was really sweet. Right. Um, and by God, Tribal Sorceries and in Instance didn't make it out of what? Three sets, three blocks? It was Lorwyn Shadowmore. We showed up to, you know, Zendikar, and it was like, nah, we're good. Well, then we showed up to Shards, and then we showed up to Zendikar. So we got right. Tribal Sorceries all the way so through about, like half Zendikar. a dozen sets, nine sets, something like that. But Wizards, and I think rightfully, just was like, we could tribal everything. You know, they could, right. it was so arbitrary as to why this is tribal, and this other thing is like, why isn't that Tribal Sorcery Soldier? Because you're making soldiers or whatever. So it got a little silly. Uh, that said, Aaron, what's your break? So Ruben touched on something that I personally enjoy. Uh, board wipes that you can sort of manipulate to either um, not affect you as much or to even come out ahead on the deal on. Um, this was a card that didn't really impress me very much when it was standard legal. I don't think it saw a lot of play. I didn't really gain a new appreciation for it until I started playing Commander, um, specifically in my Shi Ray deck. Um, and I realized that it can be just a sack outlet for me, or it can just kill all your stuff. Um, my number eight is Killing Wave. Um, mm -hmm. So Killing Wave is X and a black. It's a sorcery for each creature. Its controller sacrifices it unless they pay X life. So for example, you might tap your Cabal Coffers and be like, all right, you all pay five life per creature. I'm not paying that because I want everything of mine to die. <laughs> and so everyone else is having these tough, Sophie's choice decisions, and I'm like, whoop, <laughs> stack everything. Right. I get everything back, and you guys are screwed. And I'm um, having to make that choice. I'm like, what do I really care about? You know, is this creature worth five life? Um, you know, and if they go too far, you can just kill them. And so um, I love the choices that this card inspires. Um, and sometimes I've just, I've even done it for zero. It's like, um, I need to sack a uh, zero life, zero, zero. And people are like, I just won't pay the life. Like, yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't really care. Yes. Yeah. I can't hear you over the sound of putting all my creatures <laughs> in my graveyard. That's where they go. And then just right. count the triggers. It feels great. That's terrific. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think I think it's always uh, this. This card reminds me that even though red is the native home of the Punisher mechanic, black seems to always get the good Punisher mechanic stuff. Uh, you know, Athreos. And Killing Wave, as is mentioned here, Torment of Hailfire. Um, you know the the the. You have a choice. Neither are good for you. Um, you know, so it, it's it's pretty pretty funny. I will join you in the X spell category, uh, oh. as this one was one. And man, I loved it. This was you know right around the time where I was like traveling to all the things. I was meeting all the R and D people. I was getting you know getting to do all the fun stuff. And uh, this card showed up, and it was one of those where I was like, really, this thing seems ins really you know in terms of what it did because I thought that was nuts. Because at the time when I went on the Magic Cruise, I got to ask Mike Turian about making Conflux. I love Conflux, your conversations with him. That was great. And the Conflux, because <laughs> they mainly were going with me going like, uh, what? He's like, it'd be fun, right? It'd be fun. He's always like, it's fun. It's, it's, fun. Fun. it's so fun. 
Right. And, and for what it's worth, as we see these days in standard and everything's ridiculous, it actually is really fun. But when I was like, Marshall Coup is an incredible board wire. That thing, seven mana, I get five guys, I get nothing? That seems incredible. Marshall Coup is two white and X for a rare sorcery originally from Conflux. You put X11 one, one white soldier creature tokens into play, and if X is five or more, destroy all other creatures. And that, to me, was a hell of a card. It was super exciting, and I loved it. Yeah. What an interesting design uh, on Marshall Coup. Uh, originally part of, I think it was a full cycle. Um, Might have been a partial cycle. Oh, no, this was part of the Naya cycle. So there was mm-hmm. a green one, the red one, Banefire. Uh, or this was the white one, the red one was Banefire. And then there was another green one that if you paid five or more, something happened that I'm forgetting. Um, I believe. Sure. Uh, Marshall Coup, what's up? No, go ahead. Uh, Marshall Coup, though, is really interesting because of the decks that it appears in. It's either in, like, hard board control or tokens, which is not an overlap you usually see on, <laughs> on cards, um, which is kind of hilarious. What a really cool card, though. Yeah, I mean, I uh, made Pro Tour Top 8s largely as, like, one-ofs in sideboards, for what sure. it's worth. My but favorite story one, with Marshall Coup. Yeah, sorry. Go my ahead. favorite story with Marshall Coup was I had it in my Queen Marchesa deck once, and I was also running Elbrus the Binding Blade. Ooh, nice. So I had done like the board wipe, and my friends were like, ooh, you got a bunch of one ones. And I was like, yeah, it's a two one. Take two. <laughs> and then before I knew it, I had a Withengar Unbrown, and it was glorious. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Another, another possible nominee for our Demon of the Week. Yes. It's true. All right, let's move in here to number seven. Ruben, do you have a number seven? I sure do. It is a card that has appeared in, for my money, the best standard deck of all time. Um, It is a card that is in cubes forever and is probably the card I pick first in every cube if it's in my opening pack. Um, It is what I think of when I think blue board wipe. It wipes the board completely clean, pristine. And it is upheaval. Nope. Yep. Upheaval. I hate that card. <laughs> upheaval is originally from Odyssey. You're that yeah. jerk. I am. Uh. Four colors, blue, blue, sorcery. Return all permanents to their owner's <sighs> hands. Why? Obviously, it's banned in Commander. Nice yes. mark there. It's won a Pro Tour. It also won Worlds. Uh. Um, the Pro Tour one was the Blue Green Madness deck that I love so much. Shout out to Ken Ho. Uh, but the, it, it won Worlds when Carlos Romau won with Psychotog, and six of the top eight was Psychotog decks, and this was four Psychotog, four Nightscape Familiar, and a bunch of control garbage. In, people. Every You think that games play out the same with, with you know, Callblade? You think games play out the same way with control, like Planeswalker control? Boy, let me tell you how games played out exactly the same with Psychotog every game. Oh. You'd, get to, you'd get to eight mana, you would you would upheaval, you'd play a land, and you'd play a Psychotog, and you'd say go. <laughs> and then your opponent would be like, uh, land. Awful. Go. And then you'd be like, draw for turn, discard eight cards, remove 30 cards from my graveyard, you're dead. Ugh. Like that's that was the game. That was it. That was yeah. Your your opponent would would play the land and then go uh, go to discard. Right. Uh, that was it. That was the entire game. Yeah. So good. Card was dumb, and just the fact that Psychotog wasn't even seen, you know, in R and D as like an incredibly important card, right. and it was just uncommon and blah blah. Anyway, Doctor Keith is insane. Now, people's ridiculous. Now, people, particularly in cubes, when you're able to do a lot of really stupid, broken things, and able to pick up your soul yeah. rings to play them again, do all this other stuff, and you know the the possibilities with upheaval and the dumb things I have done and seen others do with upheaval is pretty gross. Absolutely. Um, Miss Aaron, what's your number seven? My number seven is a red board wipe that I never leave home without. If I am playing red in Commander, I am trying to find room for this card. And nothing makes me happier than seeing that this card is starting to see modern play. Um, the Hogak Menace, uh, which uh, is, is capable of making a lot of bodies, uh, can make this card very, very inexpensive. And if there's anything more that I love, if there's anything more I love than a board wipe, 
it's a cheap board wipe. Um, my number seven is Blasphemous Act. Yep. Um, so Blasphemous Act is eight colorless and a red, although if you're paying that, you're a damn fool. Um, it's a sorcery. Uh, Blasphemous Act costs one colorless less to cast for each creature on the battlefield. Do you know how good it feels to cast this for one red? It feels amazing. Uh, Blasphemous Act deals 13 damage to each creature. It'll kill just about anything that ails you. Um, and so this feels amazing when the commander games are getting a little out of control. You pay for your one red mana board wipe and you wipe the board. Um, obviously, it's seeing player in modern right now. Hogak being eight power um, and making a, a, a field full of zombies. This, you get a, you can untap and have a red board wipe. I mean, it feels amazing. And so um, I love this card. I love the art. Um, I love the flavor of it. The 13, you know, going back to Innistrad. Um, just a great card. One of the few red cards I really, really enjoy. I mean, this is a card that has five printings and is worth over $4. So, like, yep. this card yep. sees a lot of play. with Boros Reckoner and have a great time. Just yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stuffy doll. Just whoop. Just. I mean, yeah, that's Boros, terrific. Boros Reckoner was, of course, the combo in standard that very mm -hmm. nearly won Pro Tour Montreal. Uh, really popular in those Jeskai decks as a result. Um, just just a, a fabulous way to board wipe things in Aristocrats. Um was popular in the French rights deck as a, as a means of board control because, of course, that deck didn't really care if it killed its own mana elves at a certain point. Um, it was just a, just a really interesting design, fun. I, I love it whenever there's flavor text that is flavor text and it is instead rule text. Um, and every, anytime the number 13 is referenced, we get that little moment. So just yeah. a great card. This was in Jund Aggro, it appears. The, the Aristocrats was there as well. Gruel Aggro later in the Naya. Um, th this is one of those cards that, you know, it'll break creature mirrors where, you know, your opponent just dumps them all on the board and you're like, okay, great. Count them up. Okay, then we'll pay four for this and just completely wipe your board. All right, good. And I'm going to play all my guys. Or mm -hmm. they played so many, you know, it costs two or something. And then you right. just dump the rest of your hand on the board. And so uh, being able to answer and suddenly see play play thanks to Hogak. I love it. I think that's great. I think that's also part of the thing of like, God, God help magic players for being unbelievably reactionary, which is like, this card's good. Oh, whatever shall we do? You have ruined my format forever. And it's like, no, actually there's this other cool card over here that you damn haven't played in years. Right. That turns out to be the perfect thing to kill it. Devoted Druid is a tier one deck in modern y'all like let that sink in. And I mean, yeah, it got some neat toys and horizons, but um, it's it's also putting up a fight against Hodog. Like it's it's a, it's quite a world out there. That's great. So my number seven is all about choices, the ability to choose what you want. the uh, The Chinese menu, as it were. Now, Wizards has defined this over the years as you, know, you take you know number you know ability A and ability B, stick them together. Aren't they delicious? And uh, later on, they decided to start giving you more and more options. And even today, we live in a very modal world because the more modes you got, the better it's going to play on Arena when you only have one game to make things happen. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, and this card is still popular, well over $7. Back in the day in Lorwyn, we had never seen cards given us so many options before, let alone one called Austere Command, yes. which just destroys Whatever the hell you want to destroy. Uh -huh. For two white, four generic man, it's a rare sorcery originally from Lorwyn. It says choose two, destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures with a converted mana. Converted, ugh, sorry, can destroy all creatures with a converted mana cost three or less, or destroy all creatures with a converted mana cost four or greater. This kills everything up, up one side, down the other. They care about artifacts and enchantments. You got them there. All the creatures, you got them there. Like Cryptic Command obviously was the all star from, from this cycle. But yeah. Austere is a quiet powerhouse in casual games. I have bit the bullet and bought two copies of these for Commander, and I've complained every single time, but I still fork over the money because it is a good card. If you're playing White and Commander, um, I play Queen Marchesa, I play a Pillow Fort style deck. You want to be able to destroy everything. Um, I got a copy of this in my Sharoom deck as well. It's just so good. Yep. A little bit, little bit of competitive pedigree here. <clears throat> there was an evolution of the uh, Quick and Toast decks, the five color vivid control decks mm -hmm. that Boucher and the French uh, French contingent made popular. The evolution leaned heavily more into white after a, p a period of time. This was after Eventide came out. They adopted Archon of Justice and they adopted Austere Command um, just and also adopted Rune Halo uh, in the main deck just as uh, another uh, avenue of how to combat the format. Um, and this, I think, gave Jerry Thompson his first Grand Prix win. 
um, nice. in 2008 because he, uh, had, I think that that was like his last Bastion previous, and obviously he didn't top eight a pro tour, but he was like well known as a pro and had a million top eights and could never get the win. And I'm pretty sure this one was his first win. Nice. Uh, this, man, the Amonkhet invocations for real are just awful. Like they, yeah. they were bad with the star and you just look back on them and I'm like, good God, no wonder it's only $29 because that, ugh. Oh, unreadable. Who's choosing these options? Oh, God. Ugh, that was gross. Anyway, let's move on here to number six. Ruben, what's number six? Number six is higher on someone else's list. Fair enough. Aaron, what's your number six? So it wouldn't be an Aaron Campbell list if there wasn't a dredge card. Now, I know people don't often associate board wipes with dredge, but it is possible. We have tools in our repertoire. Um, this card in particular, uh, when broken decks come forward, particularly Eldrazi Winter, um, it's always neat to see what strategies or what cards people dive deep to find to fight these new strategies. And this was a card that she saw competitive to play when Eldrazi Winter was going on. And I resolved, I paid full price for many of these. And my opponents had to read them every single time. Um, my number six is Necroplasm. Um, so Necroplasm is one colorless and two black. It's a creature type ooze, uh, one power and one toughness with dredge two. So that's fine. Ain't hurting nobody. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, put a plus one, plus one counter on Necroplasm. At the end of your turn, destroy each creature with converted mana cost equal to the number of plus one, plus one counters on Necroplasm. So most of the time, it's killing things with converted mana cost two or less. You know what's converted mana cost two or less? Endless one. Eldrazi Mimic? Yeah. <laughs> I dredge so many of these. And the feeling when you can kill a 5-5 five, five Endless one, guess what? The converted mana cost is still zero. Get rid of it. Um, feels amazing. You don't bring it out for everything. You don't want it in all for one of your decks. But when you find the right use for it, it just does what it's supposed to do. It gets rid wow. of tokens. It gets rid of little <laughs> creatures. Monastery Swift Spirits, Lingering Souls tokens. This thing laughs at tokens. Um, it's just a hilariously fun card that I love to have in my toolbox. It's a weird one. <laughs> um, it was weird back in the day, and it remains weird. Yeah. And yeah. hard to explain and or describe. Mm. But yeah, really good against zero mana cards. So if 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 something that ails you is, you know, uh, a Chalice of the Void or an Endless One. Well, it's just creatures. Oh, it's just creatures? Yeah, creatures. So an Ornithopter or mm -hmm. an Endless One. Oh, yeah. Affinity is hilarious. Uh, then, then, yeah. And you can dredge it back, so you can loop it. You know, that feels really good, too, if your opponent's like, oh, man, that sucked. And they're like, let's do it again! <laughs> wow. So I um, I, I would love to find if I can let's get, get these uh, get these characters involved here, because the character as it is, is involved on my number six, uh, I didn't follow the story back then. It was just before Mirrodin, so I didn't, I didn't follow Onslaught's story very closely. But when I came back to Magic around Darksteel or whatever, uh, and I started to go back and look at other cards and things, and I was like, wow, this girl's pissed. This girl's so mad. She's got to get her vengeance. Acroma ain't messing around yes. to get Acroma's vengeance, which is two white, four generic mana for a rare sorcery, originally an onslaught that destroys all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments, and also cycles for three generic mana. Mm -hmm. This card is sick. It's seen play. I mean... Every every cube I think I've played, if they yep. if they don't have this, I don't think I was I can't think of one without it. Let's put it that way. The power cubes that I ever played, this was always in it. It's always great. It cycles early if you just don't need it, but usually you do. Um mm -hmm. one of those cards, it's like they put cycling on cards that like you'd never cycle, which they right. do that from time to time. They don't really do it much anymore, but they used to, and it was odd. Uh but this card in and of itself is just terrific. Yeah, absolutely. There was a period there uh before it was called Commander. Uh, where this was the reason to run white in Elder Dragon Highlander. Like, this was the card that you ran white for. Hmm. Um, obviously has a good competitive pedigree, particularly in the Astral Slide decks. Um, even though it, it didn't get cycled a ton, it was still a thing that cleared the board. Um, you know, it, being able to deal with all of the troublesome permanents, including your opponent's Astral Slides or Lightning Rifts in the mirror, not to mention all of the goblins and zombies that you could sweep up on the other side of the board as well. So she is Ixidor's <laughs> right arm made into, uh, manifested into uh, a person. 
Because uh-huh. he uh, he wallowed in grief. Ixidor wallowed in grief over his lost love. So strong was the heartache when the, his shaping abilities manifested. They took the form of a chroma at the cost of his right arm. That's uh-huh. weird. She was crafted in his dream and made of his flesh. And it she was her- literally a manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> wow. He gave yeah. her one objective to avenge Navia. There you go. Here we are. Yeah, for Zoe money, Deschanel. It's fine. For my money, Ixidor might be the single most powerful non planeswalker being in Magic's entire multiverse. He's literally a reality sculptor. The mm-hmm. level of power that he ha- he ca- he wields within his person is kind of unfathomable with how uh, just ubiquitous and ridiculous his abilities are. Right. I like how his, his big ability on his card is like, just turn the guy face up. Just turn things face up. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, who cares, right? There's your five mana, three, four. Like, pumps your morphs. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's move on here to number five. Ruben, do you have a number five? I do. And my number five is one of the best cards, just, just one of the best cards of all time. Um, it is super powerful. It has been, let me see how many types of this card, how many printings of this card exist. Oh, goodness. Uh, 16, 20, 20 unique printings, including, let's see, one, two, three, four, f- four different arts, um, five different arts, five different, uh, arts, including one, the original version has one of the most famous flavor texts of all time. Leaves more room for the big ones to fight in, you know, says Jaya Ballard, Task Mage, Pyroclasm. Nice. For number five, Pyroclasm is a colorless and red sorcery originally from Ice Age. Pyroclasm deals two damage to each creature. Um, it, it, it has one of Protor, technically, as a one of in the uh, the Olirades Spiders deck. Um, I don't know if I really count that as a Protor win, but it's been in a ton of different archetypes over the years, uh, just as like the go to way to deal with early creatures. Um, it is just so all over the place. It is a spectacular magic card and I think well deserving of a top five spot. It is an incredibly oppressive magic card. There's a reason you don't see this in standard anymore. They haven't made it since magic 2011. Uh, and magic 2011 kind of had its own problems with Titans and stuff. So when you had those Titans along with literally the best weenie removal ever, like this rate is too good. Wizards will not give this to you at this rate. They will give it to you at three mana. And you're, right. you've seen that here just recently. Yeah, um, sweltering suns, for example. Sure. But, you know, but two mana, eh, two mana is a little too much in terms of you can get a two for one, three for one, or even more. Uh, if there's, you know, there's a good weenie strategy. Well, this will mean there is no good weenie strategy just because right. it exists. Just one of those oppressive exactly. cards. When when red green Tron was the evolution of Tron decks, uh, Pyroclasm was really the reason to have red in the deck at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, now, now that most everything in modern, it doesn't matter if it dies or it has three toughness. There you go. Yeah. All right. Aaron, what's number five? My number five is one of two cards on my list that I <laughs> that I cannot play in public <laughs> because I can't cast them with a straight face. I'm like, a monster. Just um, with a straight face. Think about them. <laughs> My number five is Death Cloud. <laughs> I love this card. So Death Cloud um, is a sorcery. It's originally from Darksteel. Um, it costs X and three black. It says each player loses X life, then discards X cards from their hand, then sacrifices X creatures, and then sacrifices X lands. Um, there's a Death Cloud deck in Modern that's on the fringes sometimes. Reed Duke likes to play it. Um, if you look at his uh, Magic Online results very closely, sometimes he will break it out and randomly 5-0 and and they'll never play it again. Um, but you play a deck around like Sakura Tribe Elder, you know, and you, you ramp and then you play things like Greg Tusk, you know, things that don't care if you just sacrifice them. You play Planeswalkers because Planeswalkers are not a part of this. And so you beat them to death with Garrick tokens or a Thrag Tusk, but you haven't lived until you've been like, Death Cloud for five. <laughs> and your opponent's like, what's so funny? And you're like, no! Yeah. <laughs> and then like, they forget a part of it. So they'll like do part of it. It's like, oh no. 
the cards too. Yeah. <laughs> and your opponent is just so demoralized and you're just beating him to death with a 3-3 three, three beast. In his face. And then they're like, well, that goes too. And you're like, no, no, Planeswalkers. <laughs> See, Planeswalkers didn't exist when this was made. It's so, it makes me feel so good. And just, and I can't do it. I can't take it. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have asked... Aaron Forsyth for years and years, please give me back Death Cloud. Give me oh back Death Cloud that just includes planeswalkers on it. I don't just rename it whatever, you know, rename it like, you know, poop vessel or something. Just give me something. <laughs> so Death Cloud's poop vessel. Listen. All I'm saying is I loved this effect. It was super fun, super cool back in the day with Garrick untapping lands, which would make it ridiculous. Like it was totally sweet. Bring oh. it back home. Death Cloud is amazing. Yeah, Death Cloud's fantastic. One of the most uh, powerful strategies in old extended as well. I would love to have a Death Cloud or a version of Death Cloud available again. It's such a cool card. It is cool. Um, and it sparks joy. It does. It really does. <laughs> I, I swear to you, I, it made me happy. I love the damn thing. Oh, my God. I resolved one against Bogles one time, and it was the best healing in the world because they only run like two lands. Right. You didn't even have to get crazy with it. It was like a Death Cloud for two. It was, right. like, it was so good. Wow. Uh, they have it coming though, so it's fine. Talk about battle cruiser magic. <laughs> um, one shot, one kill, X for one. Um, okay, so uh, this is interesting in that it's been a long time since they made this card. Uh, this is one of the uh, it's one of those cards that when I came back, I was like, "Whoa, that's a hell of a magic card that does a whole bunch of stuff for a whole bunch of mana." Because if you're going to pay eight mana for something, it better be impressive. It better just do everything. And I better get a back rub and dinner. That's, that's right. So and a ride home. Jeez. All right. Let's keep asking for stuff. It's fine. <laughs> Invasion brought us a bunch of cool cards, but one of the things it really brought to us was Obliterate. Obliterate is two red, six generic mana for a rare sorcery that says this spell can't be countered. Destroy all artifacts, creatures, and lands. They can't be regenerated. And oh boy, when you must kill absolutely everything, <clears throat> Obliterate is your boy. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a flavor moment, I believe. This is the one where Baron destroys everything. Yes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but yeah, um, for his family, Baron made a funeral pyre of Teleria. Um, I believe this was after Hannah died. And he just lost and just lost it. Like, this is wild. I think that that's accurate. Um, it's Baron's Hannah's dad, isn't, isn't he? Well, Baron, yeah, Baron, the master wizard, uh, was one of the teachers at the Telerian Academy. Uh, notably was Teferi's main uh, tutor. Um, and, you know, a lot of garbage happened to Talar to Talaria when the Phyrexians came, um, and they, they took everything away. This was sort of at the start of the time, uh, distortion. Yeah, so Gamepedia says, Baron returned to Talaria with the intention of burying his daughter next to her mother. Yeah. Upon returning to his home, Baron discovered the Phyrexians had finally discovered the location of Urza's base. Baron cast a spell he had vowed never to cast, destroying the islands, the Phyrexians, the Academy, and himself. So he had had a pretty bad day leading up to it, and then that yeah. was just kind of like the final straw. Yeah. And unfortunately, in Future Sight, it was revealed that Baron's obliteration spell worsened the time rift caused by Urza's time destruction, <sighs> causing a magical phenomenon so powerful that it threatened the whole multiverse and cannot be closed yeah. by normal methods. Goodness yeah, I, it's, um, it is one of, canonically, the most powerful spells ever cast. Um, of course, Urza's Ruinous Blast being among them, the World Spell being among them, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. Yeah, it's sweet. All right, let's move here to number four. Ruben, what's your number four? My number four, I don't know if you can believe this, <gasps> is also higher on someone else's No. Oh my goodness. No. Aaron, what's number four? My number four is another card that I can't cast with a straight face, um, but it has it has taught me how to work on my poker face because you, you part of the joy of this card is watching people walk into it acting like you don't care like all right what do you got um and you just you, and they want and they do every single time and that's what makes it so great but when you can finally let your poker face <laughs> it feels so good whenever for a subtle direction <laughs> Mm. So Settle the Wreckage is two colorless and two white. It's an instant uh, from Ixalan. Uh, exile all attacking creatures, target player controls. 
<laughs> Everyone, um, that player may search his or her library for that many basic land cards. Put them out of the battlefield, tap and shuffle your library. Um, I don't play standard very often, um, but the last time standard, the last pre-rotation standard, uh, Approach of the Second Sun was my deck of choice because it had exactly the amount of interaction that I like, which is none. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I would just sit there and I would just be stone-faced like, all right, what do you got? And every time, every single time, people would be like, whoop, and then I'd be like, so I'm not good. <laughs> and it just feels so good. And everything goes. And then they get a bunch of crappy lands, which you don't care about because you probably have counter spells. Um, and it just feels so good. I just put this in my Marchesa deck in EDH. People never expect to see this in EDH. They're like, what? Um, it's even seen play in modern. You know, there's those, there are those people who love playing blue, white, and modern. So this sees modern play now, sure. especially with dredge and graveyard decks. But this card just fills me with so much joy because every time, you know, and you can, you can not attack with everything. Like some people will play around it and purposely keep a creature back or keep two deck. But damn it, there's some of those players that can't help themselves. And every time just whoop. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this was the number one card of like, okay, I got him with you. You know what? I got him with the alpha, right? I'm just going to smash that attack button, arena. It's whatever, man. Just overwhelm you. Are you like torrential gear hole? Can just do it again? Oh, yeah. my God. That form yeah, this ugly. card, uh, it may spark joy for Aaron. This one does not spark joy for Ruben. Oh. Although I do love attacking with a bunch of garbage red creatures into a settle. Ha! <laughs> Go get five of your lands, and then I'm like experimental frenzy. Sure, eighty thousand cards. Yeah, it's not as good now, but yeah, it's, not, it's not nearly as good anymore. Uh, this is a card that I do not anticipate anything remotely close ever being printed again because of how miserable of a format it um, encourages. Like this is a card that may that really warps what is good a lot. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't think that we'll, we'll, we'll see the like of Settle the Wreckage ever again. Or even you as, you as Kanta, like they're about to attack you and then you pay your three to look and it's like, whoop. <laughs> like if, like if Rule Spellbreaker had been in Rivals of Ixalan, you know, yeah. obviously not name that and whatever, yeah. but like, you know, if it would have stopped that, give them, give you one set of this, right? right? You get one set, but like, like you made reflective, dinos- reflective shield triceratops. Right. Yeah. Like, whatever. I mean, seriously, you made dinosaurs and they sucked partially because this card was way better than anything your dinosaurs could be doing, yep. Yep. which was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Unfortunate. All right. So this next one is a, uh, is, is a damn fine magic card that has seen lots and lots of play still worth almost 10 bucks. Even all these years later, four different printings. Uh, it's also one of those cards that when I came back to magic, I was just like, Oh, this is really good. But no one was playing it that much at the time. And then then they kind of figured it out because then, you know, like Tron showed up and Tooth and Nail and whatever. Um, because around the world of Mirrodin, I, I don't know what was super special about this weird little egg-shaped thing, but that Oblivion Stone, people were afraid of that thing. Sure, it, was, well, yep. it was awesome. <laughs> Oblivion Stone is a three generic mana artifact, a rare from Mirrodin originally. Four generic mana tap colon, put a fate counter on target permanent. Or five generic mana, tap, sacrifice it, destroy each non-land permanent without a fate counter on it, then remove all fate counters from all permanents. This thing answers everything, obviously creatures, and everything else too. Just... <laughs> Yeah, we finally found one of my hires. This was my number 10. Nice. Um, Oblivion Stone is a, uh, a an absurd card. Obviously seeing a ton of uh, uh, play to this day, particularly in those Tron decks that we've referenced over and over and over again. Um, really cool card in, in Commander as well. Um, and, and just uh, an interesting effect. Um, fate counters have just sort of like this... Um, feeling about them of like ooh, what does that mean right like it doesn't right. even actually matter what type that what the name is um but yeah i i think that this is just a i mean it's so uh so unique that you can't you can't really reprint it anywhere that isn't like a commander or a specialty a set right like i call but it masters it is. which is what which is what had it last right but but it is one of if not the uh most feared it, it's it's probably the most feared permanent on any of our lists. It's weird how like the original painting showed it as almost I would almost say like a three or four foot size 
stone thing. Right. And then they had the iconic Masters version. The guy's just holding like a like a ball in his hand that's blowing right. up. I mean, like, mm, that doesn't feel super Oblivion stony to me, you know, an epic effect that, like, the fate of the world. Right. You know, I'll, t- I'll take two guys going, like, Bleh. Yeah, I mean, another one of those board wipes that you can manipulate to come out ahead. You know, I don't think I've ever really seen anybody put counters on things, but, like, if you had to, you know, you could put it on your Karn, put it on your Ugin. Oh, okay. Um, right. You know, save exactly what you're trying to save. I like that. Right. Right. A lot of Q sure. play. A lot of Q play. Exactly. Tons of Q play. If you're in a position where you can be like, I don't have to wrath yet. Like, they've got, like, you know, I'm taking like three damage. I'm at yeah, out of twenty, so I'll just I'll protect my you know whatever. I'll protect my other Oblivion Stone, right? Mm-hmm. Or or you know just my garbage planeswalker that's not going to die this turn. Um, you know, obviously this is the uh, the heir apparent to this is the heir to the throne of uh, Nevenral's disc. Um, hopefully, we get a revisit to Karn trying to blow up New Phyrexia with the Golgothian Silex, and it'll call back to Oblivion Stone in some way in the next five years or whatever. Um, I think I think that uh, that this is this is the kind of card that Wizards calls back to as well. So hopefully, right. we get something similar. All right, this is the time of this is the perfect time of artifact that will be on a creature, and the creature will have the exact same abilities. You know, and because you have to wait a turn to tap it or whatever, and it's a three mana three three or something, sure. uh, you know, it'd be kind of interesting. Uh, that said, let's move on here to number three. Ruben, what's number three? My number three is one of the most. I'm gonna say it is the most uh, successful single board wipe in its standard format. Wow. Um, I think that when it was around, it was the format. Um, It was just everywhere. I mean, you couldn't avoid it. Um, And we talk about how formats are sort of defined by their wraths in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And nowhere was that more true than during Return to Ravnica standard, when every single place you looked was decks that had Supreme Verdict. Mm -hmm. Colorless, white, white, blue gives you a sorcery, destroy all creatures, Supreme Verdict can't be countered. Um, We will never see the like of Supreme Verdict ever again in Standard. Uh, It was popular in Flash. It even uh, uh, snuck its way into older formats, but in in particular, it was in those Jeskai control decks. Um, Sphinx's Revelation may be the headliner uh, now looking back, but the decks would not have been playable, would not have been possible without four Supreme Verdicts in the main. I mean, you had all over Pro Tour uh, London and uh, in terms of recently with Blue White Control. I mean, it, it still played to this day, right? Yeah. So you have anything. Multiple formats, Legacy, Modern. Right. You have anything from Return to Ravnica that still sees play to this day. Yeah. Like, you know, it's crazy good. I mean, it was, that was the standard that, I mean, we were feeling the after effects of that for many sets to come. Look at all the board wipes that we got after it and hostilities, languish. I mean, how many sets were we disappointed by the board wipes because we had been given this amazing gift? Um, and look at how many, I mean, look at Mono Blue Temple right now in standard where you're playing how many, how many spell pierces where you can counter board wipes. I mean, they gave aggro decks tools to fight board wipes in recent sets. And, 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 you know, it, can you imagine the Supreme Verdict now? Like, I mean, these right. decks wouldn't have a chance. Merfolk and Standard wouldn't be a thing because you'd counter everything. Like, it wasn't relevant until it was, and um, it just changed the game. Like, we're only now are they starting to maybe loosen up a little bit and give us, like, good draw spells and good board wipes. But for a while there, it was bad. Like, we had bad board wipes. <laughs> well, we had, we had board wipes. Go ahead. Sorry. They didn't give us a four-mana yep. destroy all creatures, period again until kaya's wrath mm-hmm. seven years later or whatever yeah, yeah. So until we went back to ravnica been it's been a minute the cl- mm-hmm. i mean they, they would give us a phyrexian scriptures yeah. right or they give us a ritual of soot but they weren't going to give us actual supreme yeah. Earth. right supreme Earth can have itself uh, what i would say is it's it created uh a bad it, it created a worse environment you know, like the, the environment that Supreme Verdict lives in and what it encourages and what it rewards is not 
being sort of tricksy with it and not being clever with your creatures and how you play them and what you counter and what you bounce and what gives hexproof or whatever. It's just like, nope, just this is happening and you lose. And there's nothing you can do about it because this is going to happen. Supreme Verdict, Untapped Supreme Verdict happened all the time. And those games were just over. Like it was done because then they had this awesome draw spell that gained them life and cards. And the game was just over. You didn't know it yet, but the game was over. So what this card does is it's not as bad as what it, you know what I'm saying? Not as bad as what it does per se. It's what it does to the environment. Exactly. It, it did warp warp a lot of things for sure. Absolutely. Aaron, what's number three? My number three. Uh, so uh, my top 10 list, I usually like to spend the bottom five on like commander cards or cards that aren't seeing any competitive play. And then as I start to inch closer to the top five and above, I start to go for cards that have actually seen competitive play. You know, I mentioned Blasphemous Act just now starting to see sideboard play, you know, Necroplasm seeing fringe play and so on and so forth. And so this is a card that... Uh, your, tops, your tops tend to be much more <laughs> my tops tend to be a little bit more filled out than my bottoms so yeah, just saying. um but uh so my number three is a card i uh, i prob this is you know how i feel about red cards <laughs> uh, but i can say this is probably one of the top three red cards i've ever cast in my entire life um and i love doing it it is a board wipe that also doubles as a win con um, we've talked about how versatile board wipes can be in terms of, you know, a Chroma's Vengeance having cycling, uh, modal spells, and nothing's more flexible than this part of my number three, which is Conflagrate. Um, so Conflagrate is X, X, and a red. It's a sorcery. Uh, Conflagrate deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or players. Um, you can flashback it for two red and discard X cards. Um, you can use this just as a discard outlet. I played it for zero on turn one and then just had it sit there um, until you need to pitch things to it and, and fry some creatures. Um, this used to be the win condition in Ad Nauseam. This was one of the ways that you could win the game with your Lightning Storms. Um, if you needed to go a little bit higher than Lightning Storm could go, you could do it with Conflagrate. Um, you could also divide the damage in such a way to where you could get around Spellskite. That's a neat little trick you can do. Um, but you guys blow people's face off with this. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times you just bide your time, loam. Yeah. Loam. Two, loam, loam. What are you at? Uh, eight. Yeah. <laughs> it just feels amazing. Or dare I say it feels conflagrate. Just it feels great. <laughs> conflagrate. Conflagrate. It feels amazing. I've met, this is the most, so one of the most fun, one of so, words fail me. Um, some of the most fun I've ever had casting a red card before. Just great. Sure. I mean, the card still sees infinite play. It's basically the dredge card at this point, but it was. Modern dredge. They can see play in World 2008 and uh, Swan's Combo, which mm. is ooh hilarious. I like that. That's a good one. That's good. I like that one. But uh, uh, in, in the Broken Pact, uh, when they were chasing down a serial killer, uh, the method of killing that the serial killer used was called the conflagration. Oh, nice! Uh, was and whenever I thought about it, that was that was the where the name came from. Um, yeah, one of the weirdest cards. I always forget that it like can do. It, it's not just that it's an X spell you can discard cards to. It also can do it to a bunch of stuff. I forgot that it was even a board. Mm -hmm. board. It's true. But, yeah, I have uh, wiped boards with this. It just feels amazing. Well, for my number three, I got to kick it old school. Uh, super duper old school. One of the first cards I ever encountered. Uh, one of the first cards that was ever explained to me why it was good. Uh, as they, you know, it's like, well, okay, but it's going to destroy stuff. What's well, going to destroy all the stuff? And it's like, well, I don't want to destroy my stuff. That sounds stupid. And they're like, no, no, sometimes you want to destroy your stuff. And sometimes it doesn't matter because you get so many of their cards as a result of popping your, your Nev disc. And I'm like, what's a Nev? Who's a Nev? The disc? Why, why, why are we disking? And Nivenerals disc is a good way to always know how Larry Niven's name is spelled mm -hmm. because it's literally exactly backwards. Um, but Nivenerals disc uh, in and of itself was a card that they just sort of kept printing. And then right around fourth edition ish and even in fifth edition, really, um, they were like, OK, the, maybe that was a mistake and we shouldn't have this in standard because it's four generic mana for a rare artifact that was originally an alpha. And uh, it comes into play, enters, enters the battlefield tapped, and for one generic mana, you tap, colon, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. That means you destroy itself, which means if you're able to give this thing indestructible, you can use it over and over again. But just back in the day, it was like, this is how you got rid of your necropotence. This is how you swept the board when White Weenie got out of control. Uh, this was a card that I didn't like playing with, but I played against a lot because I was that White Weenie player. And I was like, I got to disenchant your disc. But as long as I got that disenchant, I got you because this thing just was, was amazing. And it ran all sorts of things until they took it out. 
So until yeah. more or less I left the game, Nev Disc was there. Yeah, this used to be something I would, I tend to still put this in a lot of my mono black decks when I'm playing Commander because black is a really difficult time dealing with certain things. And so um, this is an answer that you can tutor for that isn't bound by color and that can destroy permanence that you have a hard time with. And so um, I like it. It's a way of kind of putting people on notice, you know, just sending a message to people of like, don't make, it's like when your mom used to say, don't make me get off the couch. That's what disc is. Of like, don't make me get off this couch. Like, it's it also, here. It also pulls double duty uh, and originally would pull double duty, not only uh wiping your opponent's uh, relevant permanents, but also removing your own troublesome permanents whenever they were no longer necessary, as in Necro Control, um, which won Pro Tour Dallas in the hands of uh, Paul McCabe, mm. used a lot of discs alongside his Necros to draw a bunch of cards and then get rid of the Necro when it was no longer uh, a helpful uh, thing anymore. So, yeah, Nevin Rawls' disc, just a compl absolute classic, um, you know, these days, of course, Oblivion Stone is more ubiquitous, uh, but Nev's Disc is always the OG. Nice. Yeah, the nice thing about permanent board wipes like that in Oblivion Stone is it's also it's also very easy to recur them. Um, you know, if you're, God help you if you're playing anything like Sharoom, or it's just you find a way to loop discs, you just always have a disc out. It's just, just it's just sitting there. You always have a way to stay in control of the board. I think that's great. Yeah, Nev Disc is great. Let's move on here to number two. Ruben, what's your number two? Last higher <laughs> final make higher. it a good one aaron what's your number two so my number two is a card there was a time for a set or two where commander cards were really good true name nemesis good um and these cards were going straight to the older formats and becoming very very expensive and my number two is one of them this card sees a lot of play in legacy it currently goes for 25 to 30 dollars depending on where you get it from wow. um we've talked about versatility when it comes to board wipes we've certainly covered a lot of x spells we've certainly covered spells that can destroy everything destroy certain things uh that you can tweak depending on how much damage you want to do um and this card is just amazing and scary and i love it my number two is Toxic Deluge. Um, so Toxic Deluge is two colorless and a black. That's it. Three uh, for sorcery. Add it as an additional cost to cast Toxic Deluge, pay X life. All creatures get minus X, minus X until end of turn. Gets around indestructibility. But it's exactly what you need. I mean, how great is that? Where three mana is it. You don't have to pump it like the killing wave or anything like that. You can just pay a, a three mana. And you use your life as a resource, which is amazing. Um, and you can get it rid of as little or as much as you can afford. Um, and this card is brilliant. It sees a lot of play in Legacy. Um, God help us if we ever got it in Modern. Um, has never really seen play in Vintage, but when you're good enough to go straight to the top of an older format and stay there and become a staple of the Delver decks and things like that, I've seen people do ridiculous things like this. Like, all right, I got to kill a Grizzle Brand. <laughs> I'm not happy about it, but I'll pay seven. It's like, you do what you got to do, but how flexible of a board wipe is that? It's beautiful. Yeah, the card itself is just amazing. This card, I think, took a little bit of time for people to actually started playing it. And mm -hmm. I was just, I was always just perplexed. I was like, this thing is, is this thing not nuts? This thing it is nuts. For sure. Yeah. And I was but like, nowadays, I mean, you think about, you look back on Commander 2013 and you think about True Name Nemesis and you think about Baleful Strix. And, uh, you know, a bunch of the, the EDH. Containment Priest? Containment Priest, for sure. Uh, Aloro uh, was Commander 2013 as well. Mm -hmm. And Toxic Deluge is the one that's the most expensive these days. It took a minute. And it was always, like, something that people had access to in Legacy. Uh, the Shardless Bug decks liked mm -hmm. it. You know, all of those sort of bug control-ish kind of decks wanted it to protect their Jaces and their Lilianas. But nowadays, it's getting its total due in mm -hmm. that it is. It is super well deserving of this spot on the list. Three mana to be able to deal with a fifteen fifteen or something with shroud or whatever. It's pretty great. You wow. can also tailor it to save your charm of glaze. So if your glaze are you know three fours, do it for three, kill everything else. I mean, the fact that first of all, primal vigor is the second most expensive card from Banner twenty thirteen. The fixed doubling season. The fixed doubling season, which again, both of those are ahead of True Name Nemesis, which is kind yeah. of amazing. Right. Uh, that that set. And it was gets just, rid of True Name Nemesis. <laughs> set was just it's packed awesome. with value. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, my number two, um, Wizards back in the day, uh, they would send you fifty dollar bills in the mail. And it was, it was amazing. I swear to God. And of course, magic players would complain because we're magic players. They weren't folded right. Right. And they're just like, oh, yeah, fifty. I don't like this fifty dollar thing. This is weird. Well, look, 
when they were unveiling Time Spiral, and we were just like, like Time Spiral was one of those like they nostalgia too hard, and they shouldn't have nostalgia that hard, but they did anyway. So like the super old timers just loved it; it was amazing. And when they were previewing Planar Chaos, the first thing they showed for like they took another week before they showed anything else. They just slapped it right on the homepage on Magic. They're just like, "Damnation, we yep. did it. We're going there." Oh my God. And everyone lost their freaking mind. Damnation originally showed up in Planar Chaos as a rare. It is two black, two generic mana. It is a color shifted Wrath of God. Literally the exact same text. It's a rare source where it says destroy all creatures. They can't be regenerated. Yep. That's how it does. And it's amazing. It. And Wizards didn't reprint it finally until Modern Masters 2017, which was insane. They yep. also made it an uh, Amonkhet Invocation, which kind of looks ba because the picture is amazing even though the frame's yeah. awful uh, i have i don't know there was um i have a felt damnation play mat i think it's felt it's a weird like carpet material I, it's an official play mat but yeah i've had it in my closet for years and it's damnation and it's like this weird fabric like in um, 2008 they would send us you know send magic players who were active and like you know played in fnms or whatever um as long as you were an active magic player in some fashion they would send you the magic player rewards mm -hmm. and the number one the first one was damnation it was yeah. unbelievable damnation was the card that every time a new set came out this is damnation the number crunchers would do their thing the box mappers and then Absolutely. finally they got their wish and now no one talks about damnation anymore yeah. but for a while there you couldn't go through a spoiler season without those the devoted fans like damnation damnation yeah no nope, nope. hmm. there's damnation there's damnation there's damnation there nope no nope, no nope, no nope, nope. uh I, when you really look at it like when you look at all of the gifts we've been given no pun intended it's fine you know like there's it's when you look at hindsight, you're like, I mean, it's okay, but like, it's way too good for standard play. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it saw infinite play. The infant, the, the the instant it was printed, yeah, it, it was played nonstop. Uh, I can imagine it still sees some non-zero amount of play these days. Probably, it's usually Probably. such a sideboard card. The yeah. Jun decks, Death Bugs. Jun decks usually have one or two in the sideboard. Yeah. The mid-range green black decks, maybe right. like your Marty Pyromancers. Yeah, right. right. But, My fondest memory of Damnation was uh, I'm. It's it's possible that Time Spiral, Planner Chaos, Future Sight era is when I was playing the most hours of Magic a week. Mm -hmm. um, my buddy Nick Miller and I played a ton of Magic at the time. We would go down to the Universe of Superheroes in Athens, Ohio, uh, aka the Wizards Guild, RIP, my friendly local game store from college. And we bought a box of Planar Chaos for ourselves and heads up drafted. Uh, and the very first pack of Planar Chaos that I opened, I opened a foil damnation. Whoa. And, and Nick and I played poker and I did not have a poker face on at the time. I opened it and was like, Nick. He was like, God. <laughs> and just like started cursing me out because he knew what I opened. So wow. that, was, that was nice. That's Can I tell you the secret about damnation? What's so that? I told you about how like certain cards, I hear certain things in my head where like when Spirit of the Night happens and I hear like Frank Sinatra, like Spirit of the Night. Well, whenever I cast damnation, I hear, um, I don't know if it's like Halls of the Mountain. Or they, like, you know, when you're watching like a dramatic action movie and you're like, oh, like you hear like the chorus and like yeah. the thundering drums it's right. just such a dramatic moment for me like whenever i cast a damnation i hear like that movie score in my head of like the woman singing and like the beats and just yes damnation it just feels amazing like <laughs> so i'm gonna turn the corner here to number one and you know when they sent us 50 dollar bills sometimes they would come back later and only send us 25 dollar bills Okay. Right. Nerve. How dare how, they? How dare they? Unbelievable. Yeah. Some people's children, I'll tell but you. Yes. But what they did do, it might, you know, if we're talking about board wipes, if somebody's like, you know, if my mom is like, Evan, what's a board wipe? I'm like, well, it's like a Wrath of God effect because if you're going to talk about board wipes, numero uno from alpha onward, the one thing that wipes the board, the one thing, the card that the old timers will never ever stop referencing, even if they never print it again into standard. Uh, is Wrath of God. Two white, two generic mana for a rare sorcery. Destroy all creatures that can't be regenerated directly from Alpha. Reprinted all the way through Commander 2013 and from the Vault Annihilation. Got its own brand new artwork with Heliod doing crazy stuff, which was awesome. But Wrath of God in and of itself, 
I mean, one of the very first cards that was explained to me, like as a magic player, I'm over, you know, I'm over there geeking out about Blinking Spirit, and they go, "Yeah, you can't Wrath of God it," and I'm like, "What does yeah. that mean?" Yeah. And they explain, like, "Whoa, that card kills everything. That's ridiculous." You know, don't forget the booty. And then there's a butt in it. <laughs> It took me years to see oh, yeah. that, and now my eyes just go straight, to <laughs> straight, straight to the butt. And the there's butt, a butt. It's a fine butt. It's a, <laughs> you know, it's a butt you wouldn't get these days. I don't think. That's Magic uh, the Gathering's butt. Is what that is. Wow. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, so. this was unsurprisingly my number two. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a wrath effect. This this is the top ten wrath effects. Of course, wrath is going to be number one. Um, this uh, has won a Pro Tour. Surprisingly, has only ever won one Pro Tour. Hmm. It has won Worlds three times, but only one Pro Tour one. Has not won a Pro Tour since 1996 in the hands of Michael Lacanto. Wow. What a weird statistical anomaly for the most ubiquitous four mana board clearing effect of all time. They just stopped printing it, you know. They uh, as those as those events got larger and more important, and so on. Like after sixth edition, it, I'm sorry. After let's see, we got through eighth edition, the ninth edition, all the way up through tenth, and then they were like, "That's enough." That's and it. And then they stopped doing regenerate, so we will never see Wrath of God again. Not to mention the fact that the word God is a problem, obviously, in putting in that, about- those were days that I mean, those were the days where demons were, you know, they openly talked about, you know, pentagrams right. and things like that. Like they were really running wild and trying new things. Yeah, yeah. there was and, you know, our more recent uh, versions are, of course, Day of Judgment. Uh, right. And we have gods, the, but not like right. the God, you know. Yeah, not 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 the big man upstairs. <laughs> right. I mean, Peter Atkinson recently did an interview and he was talking about how, like, you know, that we totally didn't think about, you know, the religious applications when we removed the pentagrams. And I'm like, sure, buddy. Wink, wink. Right. I'm I'm sure you didn't. Mm -hmm. Ruben, what's your number one? My number one is, look, I knew that we were going to talk about Damnation. I knew that we were going to talk about Wrath, but I wanted to have my own number one. All right. And I I knew what my number one was going to be. My number one has also won a Pro Tour. Uh, my number one actually was first and second in a pro tour uh, of themselves. Um, and so hopefully you can appreciate that. And it also expanded my vocabulary. Uh, Magic the Gathering is very good at being able to teach you new words. Oh, I know what and this you is. want to know how to describe a glacial outburst flood that happens when a volcano erupts underneath of a glacier and causes the yes. dam to float and overflow its top and have rapid incursions of sediment and rock that flow into the countryside and overwhelm all of the peasants. Well, what you got there is a Yokohalp. Yes. Wow. Yokohalps is my number one. Yokohalps, originally from Ice Age, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and lands. They can't be regenerated for colorless red red. Um, this was, of course, in uh, Ole Rade's Red Green Aggro deck. It was also in the four color control deck that Sean Fleischman got second with in that tournament. Much more uh, relevant in, th- in the Red Green control, the Stormbind kind of decks um, that were popular at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I just, I'm not sure I've ever actually seen a Yoko Hopes cast or cast one myself. But the image itself is so indelible in my mind, this sort of cartoony oh. uh, image from Richard Thomas that reminds me of like the 70s or 80s Lord of the Rings cartoon. Oh, I have. I have absolutely played. Because you're ready to hear what we call this in East Tennessee in 1996, <laughs> y'all. Is it, the, is it yokel? It oh, you're it hilarious. Yokel. Boy, this is a jockel hops. You know what I'm saying? Jockel hops, yeah. It, yeah, this was jockel hops. All I heard was jockel hops. I literally, until this very moment, has never heard anyone say yokel. It's just jockel right. hops. This card was you sweet. Know, you gotta say it like you're a Jarl from Elder Scrolls Five. This is the yokel hops. Right, and I'm just... On like, an unrelated oh. note, uh, for the listeners who can't see this, when Ruben gets really excited, his green screen jiggles. It is the cutest thing in the world. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> He's like an excited turtle. <laughs> Hashtag jiggle and green screen. I love it. I mean, nothing negative by it. Well, I'll tell you what. Yoga hopes jiggles my green screen. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Can, can find you a magic card that jiggles your green screen. Amen. Folks. There you go. Very nice. Yeah. Aaron, what's your number one? 
I hate my number one. <laughs> but I can't deny the power level. Board wipes are not perfect. Um, we've talked about how board wipes have limitations. You know, they can only sometimes deal so much damage. Um, they can only deal with certain colors or certain permanents. Uh, if things can be regenerated, uh, your board wipe might not work. If you have indestructible creatures, your board wipe might not do very much. If you have creatures that want to die, you have to be very careful of that too, because you might just kill yourself. Um, if you do a board wipe and you're playing against a blood artist deck, that can be a big scene, a bad scene for you too. But my number one, it takes care of all of those things very, very nicely, very, very cleanly. And even more so, if you can just make it happen on time, uh, my number one is Terminus. Um, so Terminus is four colorless and two white. It's a sorcery from Addison Restored, one of the, the bright shining lights of that set. Uh, it's a sorcery, put all creatures on the bottom of their owner's libraries. So if you have any death triggers, those don't come into play. Tokens, it deals with those nice and cleanly. It doesn't matter how big the creature is, if it regenerates, if it is indestructible, everything goes. Um, and if six mana is not really your thing, you know, if you're more of a bargain hunter like me, um, all you have to do is draw the card and then you can pay one white for its miracle cost. Um, and when you're playing a format like Legacy with Brainstorms and Ponders, you can have this just arrive on time. Um, do you know what it's like to have, you know, 40 power and zombies just disappear like that? I will tell you, it's freaking not fun. Um, and so this card is just everything. You know, it does a lot of things other board wipes don't. Um, the cost, you know, can be ridiculous, especially if you can engineer it that way. Um, it's just it's just an efficient answer and it does, does a lot of things that most board wipes just can't do. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a hell of a magic card that, you know, Avatar Restored uh, gets a lot of flack. First of all, it's deserved for its limited format. It's the most miserable yeah. limited format I've literally <laughs> ever played. I it's hated it. It's pretty garbage. It's just, you know, ugh, it's gross. Yeah, your format's trash. But what was not trash, I felt, was the miracle mechanic. I always thought it was fun. I thought it was exciting. I thought, yeah. yes, it's swingy, which is why Spikes hated it. But right. Timmy's, I'm a Tim. I play magic to feel things. And by God, miracles made you feel things. This would have been amazing on Arena. I mean, just you think of the moments that this card creates. You think of the the, the Brian Kibler, you know, the, the famous bonfire and, and everyone around him, their faces just looking crestfallen when he sees what happens. I mean, yeah. this is the card like Racto Showstopper that you would love to have, yeah. you know, someone like, uh, you know, noxious play on stream that moment of like, whoop, there goes your stuff and the graphics of that. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, Terminus is, and the Miracle Mechanic is, uh, it really was perfect for the end of the Pro Tour of Pro Tour Avacyn Restored, yeah. when Alexander Hain, you know, just jammed his deck full of Miracles, and so it wasn't really a miracle when he hit one, but it was still exciting to watch. Every draw step it was still fun. What's going to happen? Um, it made Feeling of Dread playable in Standard, which was adorable. Um, and of course... This is the Wonder of Wonder Miracle of the Miracles deck. Yeah. The legacy that dominated Legacy for so long and still to this day uh, is, is a powerhouse in, uh, in Legacy and a little bit in Modern. Um, the other thing that is not trash about Avacyn Restored is how much value, if you happen to have an Avacyn Restored box in your closet, uh, boy, howdy, does it still have some value attached to it with, you know, not just Cavern of Souls, um, but but also uh, Hoof, Avison, yeah, Avison, Gristlebrand. Um, there's a yeah, Sigarda is in that set. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that just cost a billion dollars. You want the one value out of your terminuses as well. Exquisite Blood is $25. That's, a, that's ridiculous. Is a 25, I'm telling you, that was a crap rare and standard. Like, you, you could not <laughs> give that thing away. Commander for the win. I'm telling yeah. you, it was insane. So, what was your number six? My number six was Damnation. Was Damnation. All right. My number four was Terminus, and my number two was Wrath of God. I see. All right. Well, that wraps up our top 10 board wipes. You will see them on the screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about, and we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. We're going to run one more of those contests next week, and then we're going to have a little hiatus. Um, so you're going to have lots of time to get in your uh, top 10 cards you want to talk about next week but that said uh before we go i want to thank my co-host thank you aaron thank you for having me thank you ruben thank you and kids remember make sure you wipe <laughs> wow 
Don't don't just wipe. Board wipe. All right. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, I hope. I hope this episode didn't make you bored. Wow. It didn't. It jiggled my green screen. It jiggles your screen. green screen. Yeah. It's that like green screen jiggle. We did our job. It's a like good green screen jiggle you get. Uh, and congratulations, and, and you know, kudos to Rich. We had no mistakes on this episode. Rich! No Yay! breaks. Wow. No stops on this Amazing. train. Absolutely. So I'm going to go to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, Cardboard.com. I have to interrupt you now just so that we can have Rich do something. Okay. <laughs> Man's got to earn his keep. That's right. Earn his You're keep. welcome. My co-host Aaron Campbell, Ruben Brussel, you guys for watching and listening. I hope you support us at patreon.com slash magic mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that helps people we exist. Catch us online at twitch.tv at magic mics on Twitter at magic mics cast or magic mics subreddit and like the magic mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at magic mics podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio only podcast at magic mics podcast at libsyn.com or find us on iTunes and Spotify or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of magic mics. Good night, everybody. <laughs>